Hi, I'm Terry Sawchuk. I'm the founder and chairman of Sawchuk Wealth. Today is Tuesday, May 3rd. I thought I'd give a quick flash update on the markets as a whole, some of the technical levels that I'm looking at. And uh, the reason that I'm doing this is as a financial advisor, one of the things that I've learned over my career is that it's, it's really difficult for our clients to stay invested, stick to a plan, stay committed when they don't really understand what the potential probabilities or ranges of potential outcomes might be. And if the market seems like this giant black hole that just sucks your money up as it goes down without any rhyme or reason and without any sort of understanding of where, you know, the next level of support might be or where the next level that the market might dip down to before it bounces, things like that, then, then I think if it's open ended like that, um, it, it becomes very difficult to stick with the plan or stick to a longer term strategy. And I think it's incumbent upon us as advisors to understand this information. And if you're not in a position as an advisor to kind of figure it out on your own, then you need to hire somebody that can give you that kind of information so that you can relay it back to your clients. Because in the end, I am not a success if my clients are not meeting their goals. And the only way for them to do that is for their investments to perform at a certain level and for us to set reasonable expectations and for them to stick to the plan. That makes sense. So let's get into some of the larger geopolitical things that are going on. The risks are growing, by the way. And this is important because as the geopolitical risks grow, volatility potentially increases. And there's an end game here, and I'll, I'll get to what I think it is. But in the meantime, um, it could get pretty bumpy. So when you, when you think about China, for example, they just recently met, uh, the, the government did with key executives at the highest level with their banking system in preparation for what would they do to protect their currency reserves in the event that they fell under the sanctions that the United States has levied against Russia or Western Europe has levied against Russia. And remember, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine shortly thereafter, I think it was February 26th, uh, the global central banks kind of got together and froze the reserve assets of the Central Bank of Russia. Now, that's not the first time it's ever happened, but it is the first time it's happened to a country that big, like the size of Russia. And this has long-term reverberations, okay? What we're witnessing is the shifting of the entire financial system. And I don't say that lightly. Now, these things take place over years, not months, certainly not weeks, but make no mistake that when we did that, when we sanctioned those central bank assets of Russia, we changed how money will be handled forever. Okay, so we're not going back to the old system. Now, how long it takes us to transition to a new system, I'm not sure. Um, a lot depends on military strategy, a lot depends on you know, economic strategy and so forth. Um, but certainly China is game planning this. And the reason that they're game planning this is because they're at least contemplating invading Taiwan, just like Russia went into Ukraine. Um, I hope it doesn't happen, but they're at least setting the table. And so we have to accept that that's a risk and that we have to game plan that into what we're doing. Uh, the EU recently said that they're not going to lift sanctions on Russia until they completely pull out of Ukraine, which includes Crimea. Uh, I don't think there's any chance of that happening, at least not in the, in the short or even intermediate term. Um, so it looks like the sanctions are going to be held against Russia long term. And why that's important is I think Russia knew this. I, I don't trust anything that the media complex says about what's going on in Ukraine. I don't believe the war stories. I don't believe, and I understand there's all kinds of video, um, and you know, but video can be manipulated. And not only that, uh, but the narratives around the videos can be manipulated. You don't know who's behind what. And when you chop things off here or chop things off there, the entire uh, meaning of the video that you're seeing can be changed. And so I just don't buy any of it. And the reason that I'm steadfast in this is because it's become very clear that the media complex has been um, has, has really been pushing a, a narrative. And I don't want to get into any of the politics behind that. It's just that's what's been happening. And so it makes it difficult to handicap you know, in the big picture, what's going on. What I think is going on is this. I don't think Russia had any illusions that they would be in and out of Ukraine quickly. I think they went in with a longer term strategy. 
Um, they are food independent and they are energy independent. And so what that means is that Russia does not need the rest of the world to survive. It doesn't mean that the people of Russia don't want McDonald's or don't want iPhones or don't want TikTok or don't want Facebook. They probably do want those things. But those are, those are strategic decisions that the leaders in Russia have made to give up some of those things in exchange for decoupling from the Western world, not just from an economic standpoint, but maybe from a social and lifestyle standpoint. OK, and again, I don't want to get into the politics of this, but if you understand that Russia is going into this for the longer term, then it adds a, another level of variability, because the longer that this military operation goes on, the more there's headline risk. OK, and, and so I think if you can understand that not only is there headline risk related to the military operation, but that both Russia and China might be working together to some degree to create a new trade arrangement um, to change the world order and to begin um, looking at how can we move off of a U.S. dollar dominant global trade system. And when you start to look at it from that perspective, you can see that this could take on a longer trajectory. OK, so in terms of our markets and why that's important is because I think right now the markets, the United States equity markets in particular, and actually fixed income markets are almost exclusively driven by what the Fed's going to do. We know that right now, this month, this week, actually, the Fed is meeting tomorrow on Wednesday and they're likely to raise rates by a half a percent. And that's not going to shock the markets. It's already priced in. But they've been very transparent and I think they'll continue to be transparent going forward about um, what they intend to do. I would not be surprised if they had some kind of language around another half a percent, maybe a 0.75% increase in June. Okay. But here's the thing that you need to understand about what the Fed is doing. You have to realize the Fed has moved the markets not by changing interest rates or changing monetary policy, but by talking about it. If you look at what's happened now, the Fed has only raised rates so far by 0.25%. The federal funds rate's gone up by what they call 25 basis points. That's it. Yet the markets have anticipated that the federal funds rate's going to get to either three or three and a half percent. It's expecting the long-term rates to get much higher than that, except I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think the Fed has done a masterful job of talking the markets into what it wants so that it has the luxury of not having to raise rates as many times and perhaps not having to tighten monetary conditions as much as they've said they might have to do based on economic conditions. And so if you look at the leading economic indicators, they're not good. They're actually turning down. So from my vantage point, looking at the leading economic indicators, looking at petrochemicals, petrochemicals are important because petrochemicals go into anything that's manufactured. And if the leading indicators, if the sales of petrochemicals are falling, that's likely to mean that manufacturing is going to roll over and that consumer demand is rolling over and that ultimately economic activity is going to slow down. We had a negative GDP quarter for the first quarter of 2022, meaning that they were expecting something like three or four percent in GDP growth and we got negative 1.2 percent GDP growth. OK, well, it takes two quarters of negative GDP growth or lack thereof to have a recession. We're already halfway there. Uh, so when we talk about inflation and I know, look, you're paying more at the pump, you're paying more for food, um, you're paying more for different types of energy um, and that's going to continue. But the rate of change is going to slow down and eventually it might actually reverse. We've seen used car prices start to come back. We've seen uh, a variety of different uh, leading indicators suggest that in certain areas of the economy that pricing is actually coming back. Now, food's going to con continue to go up. Energy is going to continue to go up, at least for a little while. And when you look at some of the other items or issues that are going on, you've got supply chain disruptions. I mean, China's been shut down. Their 40 percent of their manufacturing has been shut down for over a month due to the zero COVID policy. Um, and so that's going to disrupt supply chains. And, and that will have an impact on pricing to some degree. You've got obviously what's going on in Ukraine, the food, the wheat, the metals, 
the energy, things like that coming out. Those are those are creating what we'll call supply disruptions. And yes, that can lead to price increases, but price increases can also lead to a slowing down of demand. And the one thing that people just aren't talking a lot about is the lack of fiscal stimulus this year that we had last year. And so it created a massively outsized increase in demand that's unsustainable. And so I think as we as we move further into this year, you're actually going to see demand start to come down. And if demand comes down, pricing comes down, inflation starts to come down, um, which gives the Fed room to potentially back off the tightening, which means that they might not raise rates 14 times, like some people have said. The federal funds rate might not get to three or three and a half percent. The long end of the curve might actually start to come back. And I, I would not be surprised if we're at or relatively close to the peak in the 10 year treasury, and that over the next month or two, as it kind of rolls over, levels out, it, it'll start to come back down because the long term rates are based on economic output. And it's pretty clear to me that we're going through an economic slowdown, which means we might not get the rate hikes. It means the long term rates can come down. And it actually means we'll get potentially a dovish pivot from the Fed. If that happens, that's where the markets will have bottomed out and start the next leg up. Okay, I don't know when that's going to happen. There's no guarantee that it will happen, but I think that's a likely scenario. But the problem is between when that happens and where we are now, there's a lot of room to the downside. Okay, and I'm going to take you through the charts now. Um, I want to show you the volatility index. You can see back here at the height of the um, the early news related to COVID when it, and it was actually the coronavirus back then, if you remember, and this is in March of 2020, when the the virus concerns started to hit the markets, the markets absolutely fell apart. And the, this spike up in the volatility index directly corresponds with a fall in the prices of the assets, okay? Once we got through that initial phase though, um, and the markets bottomed out and the Fed stepped in and fired the bazookas, you can see that the volatility index basically just kind of has traded in a range since then. Now, we are creeping back up to the upper end of that range. I would not be surprised for the volati volatility index to spike above this range here, the upper end of the range for some period of time. But you'll notice that even you know whether it spiked within the range or whether it was well above the range back here, it didn't last very long. Okay, that's typically what happens is it spikes, then it reverts back to the mean. So for, from my standpoint, um, I expect volatility to continue to increase. I expect some more downside in the markets, but it'll be temporary. It'll kind of peak, the markets will bottom, and then we'll kind of move back into this channel and we'll hopefully start to plot a move up. Now, as far as let's talk about ranges, because in the beginning of this video, I talked about how it's much easier for a client to stay put if they have some level of understanding or expectations as to what the markets might do um, in terms of support and resistance levels. Um, and then, you know, even more important to have strategy for hand handling this, which I'll get to later, but, but just understanding where we are, okay? We just, on the NASDAQ, we just dipped below an important support level, which is at around 13,000. Uh, this chart's a day old. Um, and at the time, the, uh, the, the NDX, which is the NASDAQ 100, um, had dipped all the way down to 12,836. So we're well below the 13,000 level. That doesn't mean that it can't bounce off of this support level and start another leg up. Okay, it's possible that it could do that. I don't think that's the most likely scenario, but it, but it is a possibility. Okay, another possibility is that we kind of have broken this support and we go down and we test the next level of support, okay, which would be around 11,800 on the NASDAQ 100. That's a little less than 10% from where we are right now. Uh, I think it's at least a, a decent chance we're going to go back and test that. And actually, um, there, there's a, a level down here. It looks like 10,600 on the NASDAQ 100. Um, that's the, what they call the golden pocket or the 0.618 Fibonacci retracement level. I don't expect you to know what that means. It's just another level of support, and that's an important level of support. And it is possible that we could see the NASDAQ potentially dip down to that level. That would be about as far as I could see, at least for now, the NASDAQ going based on the data that we have in front of us. That could change 
I mean, it could deteriorate, but I don't think it's the most likely scenario. So if you're an investor and you're a buy and hold type of, of a strategist, you just have to understand that you might endure another 10 to 20 percent leg down in the NASDAQ in something similar in the S&P 500. And then you have to decide whether you're willing to kind of accept that downside risk and know that that's where your thresholds are, are likely to be and that it might be a while before we bounce off of that. OK, um, and if you're not comfortable with that, then, you know, pairing back some equity here if you don't want to ride that down, might not be the worst strategy because there is a, a reasonable uh, chance that we could go back and test at least 11,800 and possibly all the way down to 10,600 on the NASDAQ. That's a big drop from here. Um, we're already down 22% on the NASDAQ uh, year to date. So, I mean, we've we've seen a pretty significant downturn, but I'm not sure that we're done yet. Okay, so having said that, as an advisor, the way that we deal with this and why our clients haven't gotten whacked uh, like the NASDAQ has in general is because we have two ways of dealing with this. We have an algorithm, a company that we use has an algorithm that kind of removes equity as the market falls. There's certain thresholds. There's a specific technical, uh, technical indicator that the system follows. And once certain thresholds are breached, um, certain amount of money has moved to cash. Right now, for example, there's more than 40% of that portfolio is in cash. If the market dips, I would imagine another 1% or 2% from here, uh, we'll probably see it go to 50 or 60% cash, which will give that system a lot of dry powder to get back into the market once it ultimately bottoms out. So one way to deal with the volatility is to have a system that uses an algorithm. The other way that we... Um, manage risk is by just not letting it happen in the first place. And we use certain insurance companies that have strategies that um, have buffers and floors and other built-in mechanisms uh, that just mathematically limit the downside to a certain level. Okay, And so for a lot of our retired clients who don't want to see a lot of volatility, those systems work great. Um, the important aspect is that they don't give up the potential for the, um, the accounts to grow as the market ultimately recovers. So you want to capture um, a fair amount of the upside. You want to limit the drawdowns. And when we combine these two systems, what we find is that we can radically reduce overall volatility, still capture a big chunk of the potential longer term returns and not have to put money in bonds. Right. The problem with bonds right now is as rates are rising, especially in the shorter end of the curve, those, those values keep falling. And, you know, it, this is an odd year, but it's a perfect example of how if you just stuck with a typical 60-40 portfolio, 60% 60 equities, 40% bonds, you've absolutely gotten obliterated this year. I'm not a believer in that strategy. And so our clients have not had anywhere near uh, the downside drawdown that that model uh, would have had. Um, and it's what a lot of financial advisors use. They, they talk about a 60-40 or 70-30 model, and those simply haven't held up. The other thing I would say is that we're, in, we're not in a buy and hold environment. Uh, we're in a, at least a cyclical and possibly secular bear market. And you know if you're in that type of an environment, it's not buy the dip. It's actually sell the rip. You're, you're, you're going to want to reduce equity exposure and reduce risk, at least, as we get some of these bounces, because the, the bounce, and if you can see it in this chart as a good example, the bounces have been short-lived and none of them have gotten higher than the previous high, right? This is a series of lower highs and lower lows. Um, and if that's the case, then it's definitely not a buy and hold environment. Um, and it's definitely not something that I, I would suggest that you stick to, you know, a 60-40 or 70-30 model. So, I hope this helps you understand what's going on in the markets. I hope this helps you understand, um, you know, where the probable or at least potential ranges might be. Um, and then, you know, you can decide how you want to handle that going forward. If you like the video, uh, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. We're at Sawchuck Wealth. I'd encourage you to do that. You'll get these videos when they first come out and they're obviously most relevant. We've got a lot of content on the page. We also have a podcast. Um, that uh, you can go to Apple iTunes and it's called In the Lion's Den. And you're more than welcome to, I'd encourage you actually to download uh, our podcast. Some of it's economic, some of it's retirement planning, some of it's lifestyle and interest. So there's a lot going on there. 
but I think it's pretty good stuff. And uh, with that said, I appreciate you watching the video today and uh, keep an eye out for more and we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch.